Good morning. Welcome to the 585th board meeting of the California Regional Water Quality Control Board for the Central Valley Region. I'm Mark Bradford. One quick second for this stream to start. Mark. Sorry, what was that? Uh, the stream has started now. We are good to go. Okay, let me back up then. Good morning. Welcome to the 585th board meeting of the California Regional Water Quality Control Board, Central Valley Region. I'm Mark Bradford, chair of the board. I will introduce the other board members in just one minute. For people who want to listen or watch the meeting online, the board's customary webcast is available. We are receiving presentations and Zoom um, comments I'm sorry, public comments online through a Zoom meeting platform. If you intend to present or comment or think you might be interested in commenting, you should have filled out an online speaker comment card. You should already be in the Zoom meeting room using the meeting ID and password provided by board staff. If you have not already received this information, you can email us now at agenda5 at waterboards.ca.gov. That email address is agenda followed by the number five with no space at waterboards.ca.gov. Include speaker comment in the subject line so we can follow up with you. For those in the Zoom meeting, you will be on mute and your camera turned off until it is time to speak. Our meeting host will then unmute you and ask you to turn on your camera if you have one. When you're done speaking and the board members have completed asking questions, you will be placed on mute and your camera turned off. I will now introduce other board members as follows. We have Denise Cadera from Allensworth, Raji Brar of Bakersfield, Sean Yang from Sacramento, Nick Obdis also from Sacramento, Elena Lee Reeder also of Sacramento, and again, I'm Mark Bradford also in Sacramento. The state board member, Nicole Morgan, is participating in this meeting and will give an update to the board shortly. I will now introduce the executive officer, Patrick Palupa, who will introduce his staff. Good morning, Chair Bradford, members of the board. Uh, one more digital meeting. Uh, I, I spoke even with uh, Bob this morning. We're working very hard to make sure that the contract and procurement is lined up so when we have our board meeting in June, we'll be able to meet in person in the Rancho Cordova office, just like the good old days. But if not, we've still got some backup options out there um, between state contracting, procurement, uh, COVID, you name it. We've had a lot of delays in getting that up to speed, uh, but we're working very hard with state boards, Department of Information Technology to make sure that we get the upgrades that we need to uh, do these Zoom meetings from uh, the, the Ranch Cordova office in a hybrid format so that it's accessible to everybody who wants to show up in person or via uh, the hybrid meeting format, which is kind of the, the, the new space that we're working on these days. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the, my team who's here today. Uh, we have Clint Snyder, Assistant Executive Officer in the Reading office. Clint actually may step away for just a minute. Um, uh, we are crossing milestone after milestone for a project that Clint has been instrumental in helping to facilitate. Uh, that's the interconnection of Paradise with uh, the city of Chico, uh, coming up with a really viable wastewater solution for both the rebuilding of Paradise and upgrades to Chico, very, very needed critical infrastructure in that part of the area. Um, and I think a, a real testament to Clint's ability to kind of find the middle ground between a lot of folks who used to not talk to each other, but are, are working very hard to find solutions to long-term infrastructure projects in that area. Um, I think the, the Division of Financial Assistance at State Board is having a meeting today, so Clint might step away for a minute or two uh, to check in on that and to see financing arrangements for uh, the very expensive but very needed project up in that area. My, my congratulations to Clint. That's another fairly significant milestone with that project uh, just earlier this week. Um, working my way down the valley, uh, we have uh, Adam Lappitz is actually tuning in from, uh, from out of state today. Uh, attending the multi-state salinity conference, but, but checking in because his staff is going to be presenting 
the item on the Upper Feather River. Uh, we also have JJ Baum, uh, Assistant Executive Officer in the Rancho Cordova office. And down in Fresno, we have uh, Clay Rogers, uh, also Assistant Executive Officer. And we are, have a larger complement of attorneys than we have just about ever had at the regional board today. Uh, I'll start with uh, Jessica Yar, Senior Staff Counsel with the board. We have Lori Oaken, uh, Senior Staff Counsel with the board. Chris Moskell, Counsel with the board. Bailey Toth Dupuis, back from a, a, a short leave of absence, um, uh, who will be splitting her time between Region 5 and Region 1. And rounding out the team, a new addition, uh, Kennedy Knight uh, from the Office of Chief Counsel, the, the newest attorney at, at the Office of Chief Counsel assigned to Region 5. Um, we have a number of support staff working the cameras, the microphones. My thanks always goes out to Jean, uh, the, the IT nerve center of this full operation, Bob Chow. Uh, Mindy Maxwell is online helping to direct traffic virtually. Uh, and again, my thanks to everybody who's making this presentation happen. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. Um, now we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, and since I didn't tap anybody on the shoulder beforehand, I'll lead this one. Okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Not quite the same looking at the flag on a screen, but that'll have to do, I guess. <laughs> okay, moving on to agenda item two is board member communications. Um, maybe start down the line here with Denise, usually has quite a few. Good morning, everyone. And this morning, I don't have quite a few. I'll just report out on one. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, um, <clears throat> we had visitors from um, Secretary um Karen Ross from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. We had Secretary uh, uh, Wade Crofer from the California Natural Resources Agency. And we had the uh, California Park Director, Armando Contreras, came out to visit us on yesterday. Uh, we received funding last year out of the California budget uh, allocation for funding for Allensworth community projects, including our state historic park. And so uh, the uh, officials were out here yesterday to talk with us, to uh, for us to share uh, updated information on the programming uh, that's going forth with the funding that we have been received, we have received. So it was a good day, a very beneficial for us to share with them our community plan, our efforts to do a regenerative agriculture here in our, our neck of the woods, as well as uh, uh, redoing a community slash civic plaza uh, in Allensworth, uh, doing everything we can in the community here to create an economic engine for the community and a tax base. So we are able to uh, not only capitalize off of the uh, historic treasures we have in our community uh, and in our region, but bring an economy to Southwest Tulare County and share the treasures of Atwell Island and many of the programs that we have within our whole system. So um, our, our goal is to promote e um, ecotourism, agritourism, cultural history, and as well as to uh, benefit from the visitors to come to the State Historic Park. Uh, it's estimated about 70,000 people and none of those dollars come into our community because we are food desert and we lack those essential services. So with the funding that has been provided to our community and our state historic park, blending those two together and creating a viable um, economic uh, alternative for Southwest Tulare County. So we were excited for to have them out yesterday, the funding that we've received and the opportunities that lie ahead for uh, Allensworth. So that's all I have this morning. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Kadara, um, one, one quick thing. Uh, I would invite. I know. I know you sent around uh, a, a 
really comprehensive letter about 2002. Uh, 22. State Historic Park, or, or 2022. Uh, with the State Historic Park uh, uh, running through everything from your engagement with Kat Taylor's office to Legislative Black Caucus uh, to the Strategic Growth Council. Um, if you'd like, I'd invite you to add that to the board member communications as well. We can put that in as an addendum if you'd like. I know there's been a tremendous amount of work that you've been spearheading and working with a variety of partners on on Ellensworth. And, and certainly I could give you another platform to share those accomplishments uh, by adding those to your board communications, if, if you'd so desire. Okay, I I would be happy to. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll put that in for the next go around. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. That was a really mind-boggling amount of work that you guys have accomplished, and you've got a lot more ahead of you. So, uh, excellent job. Um, let's see. Is there anybody, any other board members with communications this this morning? No, Nick. Sean. Okay, hearing none. I have a few. I've had, uh, I was on a couple of calls, uh, one on January 5th and another one on the 9th of February regarding CV salts updates, uh, management zone implementation plans, PO study updates. Um, the one in February was well attended. I think there were over 50 participants on that call. Uh, we also had a call planning a board retreat uh, that'll be part of our June meeting, I believe. Uh, we also talked about groundwater recharge challenges given all the storm um, discharges we had in January. And I guess we'll have some more here uh, this weekend. And uh, talked a little bit about the new toxicity standards from EPA regarding NIPTES permitting. And then, um, I just had a brief board briefing call on what was that the 17th so that's all i had are there any questions about any of that if not we'll move on to agenda item three which is uh the state liaison update from nicole morgan and uh nicole the floor is yours good morning chair bradford and members of the board I'm happy to be able to join you virtually this morning and provide a liaison report. So speaking of storms and um, you know those that we've had and looking forward to the rain event you know coming up here. So um, we took advantage of the runoff from the nine atmospheric rivers that reached California in late December and early January to reach storage above and below ground. The water supply strategy called on the state to expand and average annual groundwater storage by at least 500,000 acre feet. Agencies are working together to create incentives, streamline permits, and provide technical assistance to facilitate recharge. Since 2020, the state board has provided a total of 1 billion in assistance to 13 projects that bring a total of 88,000 acre feet a year to the state's water supply. Five of these projects are already complete and are currently providing 25,000 acre feet of additional storage. To date, the state board also has provided 176 million for 67 stormwater capture projects funded under voter approved proposition one of 2014. Since 2016, the state board has issued 24 temporary um, groundwater recharge permits. These are 180 day and five year permits five of which were just issued this year. So changing subjects, um, you know, the governor's office released the administration's proposed budget and on January 10th, um, I'll make sure that you all get a, um, a link to that uh, announcement. Um, the budget as proposed may be modified, but a final budget must be adopted by the legislature by July 2023. The board strategic work plan. So during our January 18th store, um, state board meeting, staff presented the 2023 state board strategic work plan for discussion among board members and staff leadership. This is a annual discussion that we have at the state board where we take a look each year at our, um, our priorities and go through those, see which ones we have com um, completed to make sure that we are looking at our overall you know, workload and um, you know, talking as a board 
what the priorities are for not just this year, but you know the upcoming years here. And so this year we did um, look at aligning our priorities with the uh, water supply strategy, and we indicated what um, which one of the our priorities are also um, within the water supply strategy. And so you'll see a little, I believe it's a little blue W um, to indicate that. Also at the January 18th um, board meeting, um, staff also presented the 2023-2025 racial, equ racial equity action plan. Um, and so the um, action plan will, so we're, we've been implementing, you know, actions um, since the adoption of our resolution. Um, this, you know, we went through a very public process to come up with an action plan uh, that includes um, met metrics um, and, you know, make sure that we are putting that out there, being transparent to where we're focusing um, and over these next couple of years. Staff will be, while they don't have to come back to the board on every every item, we have asked them to come back to us at least annually on this implementation so that we can be kept into the loop on what's happening there. And they will also be bringing that up at other um, meetings um, that will be you know held internally and externally. And so um, drinking water updates. Um, so our SAFER program, staff held a public webinar on February 3rd to provide an opportunity for stakeholders to review and discuss proposed changes to the 2023 drink water needs assessment. In addition, um, the SAFER advisory group held an onboarding and collaboration meetings on February 9th and 10th to welcome the newly appointed um, group meeting uh, members. The state board welcomes 11 appointees um, to the advisory group, and the first advisory group meeting will be held on March 2nd. Um, staff also um, proposed a drinking water, an expedited drinking water grant um, funding program. They've held three workshops to introduce this new proposed program that would reduce the time it takes for disadvantaged communities to get um, the assistance they need to ensure access to safe drinking water. So um, the staff, they've been taking in comments, public comments, um, looking at the proposed program. They plan to bring it back to the state board for consideration by June 30th of this year. Um, changing subjects, um, looking at hydrology and urban conservation. So um, these are December's numbers. Um, so statewide water use dropped in December to um, by 17.1% relative to December 2020 with a cumulative savings of 6%. Um, so looking at the Sacramento River watershed, the savings for December was 17.8%. And so when we compare that to November, the savings um, back in November was 12%. So it's all you know, increased there. Um, San Joaquin River, um, December was 14.1% and November was 11.5%. So we also saw, also saw an increase there. So definitely something to celebrate. We do also want to remind you that um, last year we saw an increase also. Um, but then, however, when we did hit the dry months of January, February, and March, we saw an increase in um, water use, um, most likely due to, um, you know, the months being dry and outdoor use going up. So just as we start getting towards spring, just want to remind everyone to keep up the good savings um, and so that we can, you know, adjust to just, you know, a drier climate as we continue to move forward here. So the last item, just you know, um, just talking about the water supply strategy, just want to just keep you guys up to date on the implementation of it. Um, you know, as we previously discussed in August of 20, 2022, the Office of Governor um, Gavin Newsom released the California Water Supply Strategy Adapting to Hotter, Drier Future that outlines the state's actions to increase water supply and adapt to more extreme weather patterns weather patterns caused by climate change. The state board has a lead role in some of these actions and is collaborating with other state and federal industry partners to implement the strategy. 
The water supply strategy requires the state board by January 1st of 2024, so in less than a year, working with other local water and sanitation agencies to identify recycled water projects that will hold the potential to be operational by 2030 and no later, by, later than 2040. Um, so the division, or the State Board's Division of Water Quality, um, 2022 vol volume metric report that opened earlier in, Jan um, in January, so last month, includes a new module to gather information for potential new and expanded recycled water projects that could be operational by 2030. So we're starting to gather that information so that we can identify those projects and really understand, um, you know, what projects are potentially out there. Um, another action is that is specified for the state board requires convening a strike team to identify and resolve permitting and funding obstacles for recycled water projects. So that first meeting was held on Jan January 31st. So, you know, we're moving forward and implementing implementing those actions and, um, you know, collecting data, just really, you know, trying to um, just make sure that we are keeping an eye on those actions and not letting those fall to the side. So that concludes my report for this um, board meeting. If I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I just noted that I saw it somewhere online that uh, one of the safer grants went to the Lamont, I think, water district for like $25 million. So that was pretty exciting. Is it 20? $5.4 million grant. It is the largest safer grant that went to any single um, system just since the start of the safer program. So we were down there and I apologize, you know, Roger, I should have reached out to let you know we would have been in the area. Um, we're really looking forward to getting back down there for the, um, you know, the completion of the project. So definitely we'll let you, go, let you guys know that. And they're also looking to do some work on their wastewater system. Mm -hmm. um, they, it also includes the consolidation of their neighbors in El, El, <laughs> El Monte. So um, El, El Adobe, I apologize, El Adobe. And so it's good to see some work starting down there in the area. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it happened very quickly considering when this all got kicked off. Um, we're only what eight, eight or nine months into it and already handing out money. So that's good. So that was for some another piece of the project, the emergency. So unfortunately, this part did take several years. And so, you know, not the gr greatest that's of timelines. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we definitely are looking forward to looking at this expedited program and looking to continue process improvements. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Nicole? Uh, I just had a comment. Uh, Nicole, uh, thank you for the report today. And I was excited mm -hmm. to hear about access to safe uh, drinking water to disadvantaged communities and knowing full well that oftentimes funding is allocated, but the time it takes from the, for the funding to get from where it needs to be to, uh, for, you know, from where the, the funding source to getting it to the people that really need it it's 5, 10, 12, 15 years. So to hear the, the fact that the things are gonna be expedited is very critical and important to me because I represent the disadvantaged population and the water problems, they don't go away. The delay and funding getting to them for them to get the water, uh, safe drinking water, that's where the problem is. So to hear you talk about it and expediting that process is critical. And, you know, it just goes back to what I shared at the um, uh, WQCC uh, session we had a couple of years ago when we were celebrating the 50 years of the Clean Water Act. And my comment was that now let's use this time to focus on disadvantaged communities to make sure they have safe drinking water. So this to me is part of that and I'm glad to hear it and hopefully uh, we will have more success stories of funding and projects being completed in the communities where it's needed most. Thank you very much. Nicole, um, I'd like to echo Denise's uh, comments. Um, and here in Kern County in Bakersfield, you know, I was on the front page. Everybody was really excited that Lamont is finally going to have access to safe drinking water. Um, and I, I used to live in Arvin, which is five miles away from Lamont. And uh, it's a very 
the communities are really are connected together. And I can tell you that this has been something that folks have just struggled with for years and years and years. And it's really wonderful to finally see things come to fruition, such as this project. So um, thank you from the folks in Kern County. Uh, I can speak on their behalf and we're really happy to see this project um, you know, starting off. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks again, Nicole. And if there are no more comments or questions, we'll move on to agenda item five, which is the executive officer's report. Prior to each meeting, the executive officer works with the executive- Agenda item four. I'm oh, sorry? Agenda item four, public forum. I skipped one there. Oh, I did, sorry. Mindy, uh, has anyone submitted a request to speak on any topic which is not on the agenda today? No, not under public forum. Okay, thank you. Now, <laughs> the executive officer works with the executive assistant and the board's program managers to compile a report on the status of the board's programs, its staffing, and many different initiatives the board is working on. At this time, the executive officer is available to take questions on this report. If there are any questions. Yeah, I think for starters, I'd like to uh, take a few moments to present a couple of awards. Uh, um, for first and foremost, I see Paul um, mm. on the video chat. Paul is receiving a Superior Accomplishment Award. Paul's an engineering geologist in our Fresno office and is part of the site cleanup unit. Paul is being recognized for his outstanding work performance on facility inspections and document reviews and responses. Paul joined the Central Valley Water Board in 2017 and has applied his past consulting experience and technical skills to effectively regulate and bring into compliance the facilities he oversees. Paul has been a consistent performer in the site cleanup unit, providing insightful data interpretations from complex data sets while providing outstanding responsiveness and responding in a timely manner to consultant inquiries. During this quarter, through a variety of letters and additional emails and phone calls, he has advanced progress on two oil pipeline spill corrective actions four dry cleaner cases, two PFOS assessment work plans, and a one, two, three TCP assessment, an above ground storage tank case, two high speed rail cases, and a complex groundwater pollution case in Mendota. Paul coordinates with the Department of Finance staff on an ongoing basis, keeping dry cleaner work funding funded by SCAP grants. Paul serves on two technical advisory committees that are guiding corrective action for two regional chlorinated volatile organic compound plumes, and also manages the site cleanup unit's Department of Defense projects, including work for Naval Air Station Lemoore and Crow's Landing and the various hoops and hurdles necessary for oversight of that federal government cleanup work. Paul is a valuable asset of the site cleanup unit and brings years of environmental corrective action experience to bear in providing assistance to stakeholders, staff, and in the efficient review and comment on work plans and reports. Paul carries with him a level of professionalism and dedication that well represents the Central Valley Water Board and Warren Gross, uh, his supervisor, is heartily recommending that Paul receive this award. Congratulations, Paul. I think that resume reads like a who's who of all the toxic constituents that we're primarily concerned about these days from PFOS to 123TCP. Um, I know this board and, and especially under Mark Bradford's leadership, who has been on the receiving end of many of those communications in his past life as a consultant, appreciates the professionalism and reasonableness of the board and kind of advancing these cleanups. So uh, I know I've heard nothing but good things about your work um, from Warren, uh, from the team down in Fresno. So congratulations on this award. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm humbled and <clears throat> I appreciate the kind words. And, and I'd like to thank the, the staff in the Fresno office. It is such an amazingly collaborative group of people and the support is always there. So thank you for this award and thank you to everybody in the Fresno office and through throughout the region as well. Thanks so much, Paul. Congratulations, Paul. Thanks. Next up, we have uh, an interesting award uh, in that it is being handed out to a number of staff. It was handed out by the State Water Board on 
uh, my recommendation uh, for the folks who were engaged in COVID tracing efforts. It feels like a long time ago now, um, but it really wasn't that long ago uh, that the state of California was experiencing a extraordinarily dire emergency. We didn't have COVID tests reliably distributed. We didn't have vaccines at the time. Lots of people were dying and being hospitalized for COVID. And the state's workforce was recruited into efforts to understand where COVID was showing up, who was testing positive for it, and how we could mitigate the harm by engaging with people who had been in contact with those folks. And these were a group of people recruited from the Central Valley Water Board who worked with local health departments. And sometimes it was rough going. You'd, you'd be calling up the neighbors, the friends, the relatives of people who were in uh, dire health straits, uh, sometimes uh, who had been deceased uh, from, from COVID-related illnesses, and trying to get to the bottom of where this, this came from, who should report in to get additional testing uh, to the testing centers. And, you know, this team didn't, this was not easy work. Uh, this, this was a lot of uh, human interaction with people who were very stressed, um, who were in some cases grieving for the loss of loved ones. In some cases here, this team uh, reached out to people who would be hostile to addressing COVID in a reasonable manner, and other folks who had uh, language assistance issues. And, and our team used its background to really compassionately reach out to, to folks and help keep the pandemic under control here in the state of California. So I wanna recognize this team, I'll, I'll kind of name, name off their names. They were uh, awarded this jointly with other folks from throughout the uh, state of California uh, uh, in the different regional boards and at the state board who volunteered their time uh, to these efforts. But truly, uh, it was an extraordinary effort. It was a tiring and emotionally exhaustive effort uh, they answered the call, went above and beyond, and really did some extraordinary uh, humanitarian work uh, that was not what their duty statement initially called for. This was uh, some really extraordinary work. So without further ado, uh, the folks who have received this uh, uh, Superior Accomplishment Award for COVID tracing work uh, uh, were uh, Bethany Soto, environmental scientist in the Rancho Cordova office. Camille Hang, an Associate Government Program Analyst in the Rancho Cordova Office. Keen Tran, an Associate Governmental Program Analyst in the Rancho Cordova Office. Holly Grover, an Environmental Scientist in the Rancho Cordova Office. Jenna Yang, an Environmental Scientist in the Rancho Cordova Office. Marilyn Petruescu, an, environmental, an Engineering Geologist in the Rancho Cordova Office. Peter Minkle, an, an engineering geologist in the Rancho Cordova office. Brian Rock, an engineering geologist out of Reading. Deborah Hollis, an engineering geologist out of Reading. And Ron Falkowski, an engineering geologist also out of Reading. My congratulations and my deepest thanks go out to this team uh, who's being recognized for this uh, superior accomplishment award today. Well, that does sound like a challenging assignment to put it mildly, but uh, congratulations and thank you for everybody who participated in on, on that team. Important work. Okay, now are there any questions on the executive officer report? Yeah, I'll just note that, um, you know, after meeting with uh, uh, you and Vice Chair Kadara, we made it, we've been making some changes to the executive officer report. Yeah looking to streamline it, looking to make it a little bit more useful, I think, uh, uh, and a little bit more readable, to be honest. And I think that's especially critical right now to make these efforts because we're actually gonna be using the executive officer's report to help in our engagement efforts, uh, to help in meeting the new requirements of AB 2108, uh, which require us to reach out to communities uh, engage with them on specific issues. So we've really kind of put a little bit more focus on making sure that uh, we describe what we're doing, where we're doing, what facilities are regulated, 
All of that is in this executive officer's report. We're going to continue to try and refine this report to make it more usable uh, to all the communities that we regulate, all the areas that we regulate in the state of California, um, and make it readable. You know, make it make it so that somebody could pick it up. We'll reference, look, take a look at page eleven, that all, or page twelve, or, or wherever you are in this report. It will describe the regulatory action that we're working on and give some contact information for additional information. Um, you know, I, I had also mentioned a couple things about CV salts and the nitrate control program. Uh, we are going to consistently try and update the executive officer's report with the most recent numbers for domestic well testing, uh, for replacement drinking water. Um, we are just poised later on, as soon as this board, mem board meeting concludes, I will be issuing the concurrence letters, which will kick off the next phase of the management zone implementation plan uh, uh, implementation. So right after Labor Day, those plans will be coming into the board to begin the next phase of permitting to reduce nitrate loading in the Central Valley. Um, and so there's a lot kind of wrapped up in this executive officer report. Um, I'll also add one more thing. Um, we, you know, it, it does mention some of the racial equity work that we're going to be doing. I'll be meeting with the racial equity team in a couple weeks to transition that team from writing a resolution uh, to reconvening as an accountability team and to broadening the efforts to make sure that what we committed to do at the last board meeting actually gets done. So it will be a team composed of, of some of that group, um, and they will continue to meet with our executive management team, our leadership team, uh, to make sure that we are going to meet the goals that we set out for uh, in our racial equity resolution. Uh, so with that, you know, we're, we're, we're hard at work in a number of different facets, and, and I hope the executive officer's report uh, shows that. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, okay. I, read, I read through it uh, this time and, and did uh, observe that you've got a lot more detail in there about who, what, when, why, uh, tagging them back to the regulations that you're operating under, so that was good. Um, I did have one specific question that's just in my backyard, which was uh, involving the Lower American River. I noted that there was more sampling done in late summer, fall, and the results are sometime early this year. Absolutely, absolutely. We're we're writing it up. I'll I'll kind of I'll kind of give the preview. Um, it's more of the same, uh, you know, in terms of the. Uh, uh, human signature. Uh, I know a lot of folks have been pointing to um, the homeless encampments as kind of a major contributor. They're not a major contributor to the E. coli. Certainly, we are going to keep working on it from a trash perspective because we know that there, there's a lot of trash loading in there. Um, but the E. coli signature, which will give a more comprehensive write-up as uh, our scientists continue to evaluate the data and provide a final write-up, uh, continues to show that, you know, the main drivers are, are, are geese, wild animals, and, and dogs um, uh, along the river. So we'll be, as we kind of digest that information, we'll continue to see if we can find ways of mitigating that. You know, certainly I think there are ways and in, in management practices to kind of say, look, well, maybe we maybe we'll put more doggy bags and, and trash receptacles um, along more heavily used areas of, of that waterway. Um, and perhaps that can help reduce some of the E. coli imprints. But I will say that, you know, the, the vast majority of it, you know, uh, um, those, those geese crank out a lot of E. coli. Um, and, you know, there's, there's not much we can do about that. Uh, that's kind of um, part, of the, part of what goes along with having a, a viable uh, naturally, uh, 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 natural water body. Um, so, I, but I do think that the, the underlying message of even the most recent report reporting is E. coli is still a concern, but it's largely a natural source uh, of the concern down the road. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, it's hard to tell the geese where to go and what to do. And I know they're prolific. So thanks for that update. Are there any other questions about the report? Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted, oh, sorry, Denise, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. <clears throat> um, Okay, so real quick on Mark's point, I did zero in on that as well. So I'll look forward to that report. Um, certainly on the trash front as well, I think that's an equally important component. And uh, 
I certainly want to have further discussion about partnerships with kind of local agencies and what we can do on the trash side because an inordinate amount of trash ends up obviously in our in our rivers and not just in Sacramento but obviously all over the state and in the region. So um, I do look forward to also talking about that and opportunities that may be out there to help reduce the amount that ends up in the river and ultimately in the ocean. Okay, and I just wanted to come in, first of all, to acknowledge the uh, award recipients today for the outstanding work. And uh, we as a board, uh, you know, we get to see the work that's been done and it's, it's exceptional work even for those that don't receive the awards, a, a, an exceptional amount, amount of work comes from all three of our offices, uh, very talented, professional, dedicated people to the work you do. So we, we're we very grateful for the staff and all that you do to keep our water bodies safe. And also in regards to the um, executive officer's report, um, Patrick, I, I certainly did appreciate seeing the uh, adjustments that have been made to it. Uh, it's, it, it. It is a much more readable document where you have the projects lined up and you can see all the information within each one of those particular areas. And you didn't lose any of the additional uh, reporting that goes into the document. It's just the way the layout and the way it is. I think it serves the public even better for them to uh, review the document. So I, I appreciate you hearing the board and making those adjustments. Uh, it's important. And uh, it also helps, as I said, for the public to review it and, and have a better appreciation for following along in the document. So thank you very much for that. Okay, thanks, Denise. Nick? Or, and Patrick, I, I will have a couple of other suggestions on the streamlining aspect for the year report. So I'll do that offline later, but Overall, it's so comprehensive, it's hard to get a lot of that information into a more concise format. But we, we can chat about that later. Hey, Mark, can I chime in real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> Patrick, thanks for uh, the report. Um, yeah, I too wanna just to uh, echo on those uh, award recipients, um, Paul and um, the other team um, that you you call them interesting uh, recipients. Uh, that was phenomenal with, with everything that's going on with the pandemic, um, you know, uh, how frightening it was uh, for all of us. And, uh, you know, I, I am definitely no stranger to this because I work in the hospital and uh, we kind of like the uh, forefront folks who deal with it initially. So it was very, very scary. And for the folks that, you know, put their life on the line to do this sort of work, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's so appreciative and, and there's no word to really describe it because you put your life on the line and, and you know, your family and so forth. So I just want to thank you for the bottom of my heart that that was a great work and um, phenomenal work. So thank you for um, giving the reward and uh, it's well deserved. It. So thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, if there are any more comments, and if not, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, agenda item six, the consideration of the minutes from the prior board meeting, which was held on the 8th and 9th of December in Rancho Cordova, um, or in Sacramento. Are there any edits or corrections to the December minutes? And if not, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I will move approval of the minutes. Thank you, Nick. In a second. Second. Thanks, Raji. And Mindy, can you take the roll call? Yes, board member Yang. Aye. Board member Abdus. Yes. Board member Brar. Yes. Board member Lee Reader. Yes. Vice Chair Kadara. Yes. And Chair Bradford. Yes. Thanks, Mindy. Okay, the next item is uh, agenda item seven, the uncontested calendar. This is the time and place for a public hearing to consider uncontested items 10 through 12. 
Mindy, has anyone submitted a request to comment on any of the uncontested items? No, nobody. Okay, thank you. Are there any late revisions? So hearing no late revisions, we'll close that hearing. And again, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? A motion to approve the uncontested calendar. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I'll Second. move the uncontested calendar. Okay. Second. There we go. Thanks, Sean. And Mindy, can you take the roll call? Board member Yang. Aye. Board member Abdus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Board member Brar. Yes. Board member Lee Reader. Yes. Vice Chair Kadara. Yes. And Chair Bradford. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, agenda item eight. We're actually going to have a little presentation here. This is consideration of an order to exempt the Upper River uh, sub watershed growers from the requirements of the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. At this time, the board will consider an order to exempt growers within the Upper River, Upper Feather River sub watershed from the requirements of the Irrigated Land Regulatory Program. This hearing will be conducted in accordance with the notice of public hearing and meeting procedures published with the meeting agenda. At this time, evidence should be introduced on whether the proposed action should be taken. All persons expecting to testify, raise your right hand and take the following oath. Do you swear to the testimony you're about to give as the truth? If so, answer, I do. Please state your name, address, affiliation, and whether you have taken the oath before testifying. Following the staff presentation, interested persons will be allowed three minutes each to address the board a timer will be used. Does council have any legal issues to discuss? Not at this time. Thanks, Jessica. We will now begin the staff presentation. Not sure if you're having any trouble unmuting yourself, Victor, but um, I also have a copy of your presentation if you need me to. There you go. I got it. Yeah, sorry about that. There we go. There we go. Good morning, Chair Bradford and members of the board. Victor Bautista, staff in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, and I have taken the oath. I'm here with Sue McConnell, Chief of the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, and Petra Lee, Senior Environmental Scientist in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. Today, we are bringing in a resolution to the board to remove the requirement to participate in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program for a group of irrigated pasture and hay operations. The resolution would revise the Sacramento River Watershed General Order to exempt irrigated agriculture in the Upper Feather River subwatershed. In this presentation, I'm going to provide some background information on this project, including a summary of the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, which I'll refer to as the ILRP in this presentation. Then I will discuss the outreach, tours, case studies, UC Davis, UC Cooperative Extension research findings, the staff recommendations document, as well as proposed order revision and comments received. The Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program was developed in 2003 to protect surface waters in the Central Valley from agricultural runoff. In 2012, regulations to protect groundwater were added. The program was developed as a broad regulatory tool to encompass all commercial irrigated agriculture, especially the most intensive valley floor operations. 
Information gathered through implementation of the program through public input and research conducted has shown that it may be time to focus on intensive operations that are causing water quality issues in certain areas. There are just over 6 million acres of irrigated agriculture in the Central Valley region. The black circle on the map shows the Upper Feather River watershed. This area contains over 2 million acres of total land with 98% of it as forests and other natural areas with scattered towns. There are 30,000 irrigated agricultural acres managed by 70 ranchers and growers. Goose Lake was the first subwatershed to be exempt from the ILRP in 2021. Since then, we've met with upper watershed groups to see firsthand their low impact farming practices and to hear growers' concerns. One of the Central Valley Water Board's strategic plan objectives is adaptive prioritization, where the board tailors permits based on threat to water quality. Our proposed and adopted exemptions of these upper watersheds where data shows a low to no threat to water quality is necessary adaptive prioritization. In 2022, we met with UC Davis, UC Cooperative Extension, Upper Pitt River, and Upper Feather River watershed groups to discuss recent results from farm surveys and research done in both watersheds. I'll provide more info on the research and surveys next. Based on their findings, Central Valley Water Board staff decided it was important to address the use of pesticides in the Upper Feather River through farm tours and site-specific case studies to better understand the potential risks for water impairments. Staff could not find evidence of a risk for water quality degradation from the tour and UC Davis UC Cooperative Extension case studies. In December, 2022, staff released a draft exemption recommendation and exemption resolution for a 30-day public comment period, which I will discuss later in the presentation. Dr. Ken Tate, Dr. Tina Saito, and their colleagues at UC Davis and UC Cooperative Extension have provided invaluable information for this project through the research and reports conducted in the Upper Feather River watershed. So I want to thank them for collaborating with us. The detailed reports are included in the agenda package. The Upper Feather River Watershed 2020 Farm Survey reported just over 30,000 irrigated acres managed by 70 ranchers and growers, with 84% in grass pasture and 16% in alfalfa hay. As I mentioned before, these pasture and alfalfa operations represent less than 2% of the total land area. 4% of acres reported using nitrogen fertilizer and 16% reported using pesticides. This was confirmed by staff review of the Department of Pesticide Regulation Pesticide Use Reports and discussion with the Agricultural Commissioner. Although some ranches use nitrogen fertilizer and pesticides, UC Research and Central Valley Water Board staff find that there isn't sufficient nitrogen and pesticide use to affect beneficial uses in this watershed. Five case studies were conducted by researchers from UC Davis and UC Cooperative Extension at grower sites with pesticide applications. The studies were done via on-site farm visits and were designed as site-specific assessments to evaluate the potential risk of hydrologic transport. Pesticide amounts, application timing, application locations relative to hydrologic transport pathways and events were determined for all sites. For growers that apply pesticides on irrigated pasture, the transport risk is unlikely due to the following. Growers use a targeted approach of spot spraying dryland areas adjacent to fields. Irrigated pastures are downslope from surface waters, meaning runoff would have to flow uphill to reach surface waters. Nearest waterway to any grower is one quarter of a mile. Dry lands consume all tailwater if any is produced. And pesticides are applied once a year. 
the transport risks for growers that apply pesticides to alfalfa is also unlikely due to the following. Fields are irrigated with low sprinklers that produce no runoff. Timing of pesticide applications relative to hydrologic events prevents runoff. Nearest waterway to any grower is one mile. And all fields are surrounded by berms, roads, railroad, railroad tracks, which prohibit any surface flow from reaching nearby waterways. And pesticides are applied once a year. In summary, staff tours and site visits indicate that the case study sites are typical of operations across the watershed, the weather, soil, hydrology, irrigation, and management practices of the region make transport of pesticides unlikely. In the Valley Four regions where agriculture is the predominant land use, several water quality issues have been identified through monitoring and have emerged as the focus of efforts in the program. These include pesticides and toxicity in surface water and nitrate in groundwater. However, these impacts have not been detected in the Upper Feather River subwatershed, where open rangeland is the predominant crop type with low pesticide and fertilizer use. Surface water and groundwater monitoring conducted by multiple agencies from 2000 through 2023 in the Upper Feather River subwatershed did not find any of the program's high priority water quality issues, which again are pesticides, toxicity, and elevated nitrate. The UC Cooperative Extension 2022 Upper Feather River Economic Analysis found that while the Upper Feather River grower rarely if ever uses inputs tied to high priority water quality issues, and while none of these issues have been identified in the Upper Feather River watershed, the regulatory costs to a typical rancher here can be 31 times higher proportional to a typical Valley Four grower's costs when revenue figures are factored in. This equates to a de facto subsidization of intensive crop regions by low profit, low impact crops located hundreds of miles from the water quality issues. In December, 2022, staff released the draft exemption recommendation and exemption resolution for a 30 day public comment period. Nine comment letters were received, including from industry organization, coalition representatives, and local ranchers. A comment letter from the California Farm Bureau was inadvertently missed, but was added later for those that would like to read it. All nine commenters voiced support for the proposed exemption, as well as the request to expand the exemption to additional upper watersheds. The proposed order revision received would exempt Upper Feather River subwatershed irrigated agricultural operations from the requirement to obtain regulatory coverage in the ILRP. All comment letters were in support. If actions are needed in the future to address any unforeseen water quality issues or new priorities, an appropriate regulatory mechanism will be identified and implemented. In summary, staff supports this exemption. Data show that the existing ILRP regulatory framework is unnecessary in this watershed since high priority agricultural water quality issues are not occurring here. So adaptive prioritization is necessary. Some pesticides are used in this watershed, but staff finds these uses are infrequent, not widespread, are only used in small amounts and are used far from receiving waters. Fertilizers that could impact beneficial uses are rarely, if ever, used, and yet ranchers are paying a much higher cost proportionately. Finally, during the comment period, we only received support for this proposal with no opposition. Here's my last slide. 
staff recommends adoption of the resolution to exempt the Upper Feather River watershed from current ILRP requirements. Presently, I'd like to submit the presentation, agenda package, and associated files into the record. This concludes the presentation, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was very concise. Um, I remember discussing this with some of the, uh, the proponents for this change back in, uh, I guess it was 2019 up in Reading, and there was quite a, quite a parade of people that uh, supported this position, and as well as we had a presentation from UC Davis. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of happy to see this come to uh, the board at this point. I do have one question about the relative cost. So when it said 31 times, is that that is a proportion of their revenue because cattle are lower. Um, they, they make less money with cattle than the farmers do with with crops. Is that correct? Uh, I think so. That is correct. I think Tina is here um, from UC Davis and she could uh, make sure that that is correct. Yeah, sounded like it. OK. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board members? You actually took my question, so thank you. Ah, okay. All right, Sean. No, I, I have no questions. I mean, I, I remember we had a, a similar project a couple of years back, and I think that's what you might have been referring to, uh, Mark. So um, this is definitely a project where the impact is, is uh, less i mean low to no uh pesticide or impact and so i i i think um the staff has done a great job with the presentation uh should there be any problems that would come up i'm sure the staff will be able to handle that as well but uh, i appreciate the staff presentation that's been done victor thank you yeah i would just add uh thanks for the presentation i'd like to hear the public comments and then I'm gonna have some comments, I think afterwards uh, during board discussion. Thanks, Nick. Okay, well, uh, on that note, we will now hear from any person interested who is not party to this proceeding, but who wishes to comment. Mindy, are there any interested persons wishing to comment on this item? Yes, I have about a dozen folks that are here today. Um, I will list off the ones that are here to either answer questions or will raise their hand to speak if they want to. And then we can go through the last five or so uh, after that. Okay. So here today we have Rick Roberti with the Pluma Sierra Cattlemen's Association, president, rancher, and a falfa producer. And these folks are um, representing the Upper Feather River watershed. We have Carol Dobbs. Um, she's a representing the coalition, and she's a rancher. And I believe we have Annie Madalena, who is also a rancher. Additionally, we have Dr. Ken Tate and Dr. Tina Saiton from UC Davis here available to answer questions. And we also have Paul Rowan with the Sierra County Supervisor and Cattle Ranch, who will raise his hand if he wants to speak. Uh, for the Speakers, I will start with Tracy Shore, UC Cooperative Extension, Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor, who would like to speak. Good morning, Chairman Bradford and board members. I have taken the oath. My name is Tracy Shore, and I am the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension in Plumas in Sierra County. I have the opportunity to work with livestock producers and alfalfa growers in the region on research and production topics. Victor did a great job of summarizing the land management and conservation stewardship of the agricultural producers in the region. On behalf of the Upper Feather River Watershed Coalition, they appreciate the board recognizing the years of positive water quality data that is demonstrative of their stewardship. Additionally, they welcome the board staff visiting their family farms and ranchers and welcome you to visit too if you're in the area. Again, thank you to the staff for taking time to evaluate the specifics for the region and for the board's consideration of this agenda item. Thank you, Tracy. 
Um, next, we have Bruce Hattischel with the Northern California Water Association. Bruce, you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mindy. Uh, Bruce Hattischel, Director of Water Quality for Northern California Water Association, the third party representing the entire Sacramento Valley Water Quality Coalition. For the owners and operators of the irrigated pasture, uh, alfalfa and hay in the upper Feather River, some of whom represent generations dating back to the late 1800s who manage this land. The recommendation before you today, which the coalition and NACWA support, represents the culmination of efforts begun back in 2016 and the commitment of regional board staff and regional board members to explore a new way forward for low to no risk operations that are unlikely to cause or contribute detrimental impacts to surface or groundwater quality beneficial uses. This decision would not be, be possible without the commitment of past regional board members and staff who walk the land with the producers. Well, like Dr. Carl Longley, Denise Cadera, Lynn Coster, Rebecca Tabor, Susan Fregain, She's, on, she's retired. Gosh, we all envy that. Dana Kalesha, Adam Lappitz, Sue McConnell, and Victor Bautista, who, if I'm thinking correctly, this is his first presentation before your board, and it was exemplary. It also would not be possible without the work of Tracy Shore, who you heard from, Dr. Ken Tate, and Dr. Tina Setone, and David Lyle, who developed and documented the management practices protective of water quality through their production survey. And this day wouldn't be possible without the countless surface water quality samples taken by Carol Davis and analyzed by regional board um, approved labs or over the last 20 years, or without the assistance of ag commissioners and especially the cooperation of landowners. The comprehensive and thorough work done and, and shown by Victor in his presentation is deeply appreciated by the Sacramento Valley Coalition we look forward to more work on this and we ask you to approve it. And one, you know, one thing I would be remiss without saying is, you know, to your question, uh, Chair Bradford, you know, I think when the program started, the state water quality fee was, I don't know, 57 cents an irrigated acre. Now for irrigated pasture that doesn't apply nitrogen and rice operations, it's a dollar nine. So Certainly that factors into the cost burden um, that um, these, these types of operations uh, face uh, going forward. So thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think I was remiss in saying I have taken the oath. And um, so thank you for the opportunity and we ask you to support the recommendation of staff. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, next, we have Carrie Fisher representing the California Farm Bureau Federation. Sorry, I'm looking for it. There we go. Okay, you may unmute yourself, please. Thank you for letting me unmute. Carrie Fisher with the California Farm Bureau Federation. I have taken the oath. I represent uh, farmers and ranchers throughout all of the state, including in the Upper Feather River watershed. And we just would like to support this um, resolution for an exemption and thank the staff for continuing to look at these upper watersheds and ask that um, there's a continuation of looking at additional upper watersheds. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carrie. Uh, last, we have Pam Giacomini with Hat Creek Grown. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yay. Well, again, um, so thank you very much for considering this. Um, I think we're on the right track. And I'd just like to cue you up a little bit on what we've done in the upper pit as well. Um, I think Den Denise has been there and walked around and kicked dirt with us a little bit. Um, 
Patrick, I know, has been there. So uh, we look forward to hosting a tour at, at some point. We have uh, echoed the same work that has been done in Goose Lake and Upper Feather with the survey. So we had 102. Sue, you're going to be happy. My goal was 100, <laughs> right? We got 102 uh, surveys returned covering over 41,000 acres. And the results are amazing. We also have worked with the Ag Commissioners in all three counties to gather all the pesticide and herbicide type use. So I think we are cued to bring to you again um, an upper pit exemption type discussion. So you cue me up when, when you're ready. Um, so thank you to, to the board members and staff. Appreciate it very much. All right, thank you, Pam. I know that territory around the Pitt River a little bit, so maybe I can do a tour with you next time if there is one. Okay, Mindy, are there any other commenters now? No, that concluded the commenters. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Okay, are there any uh, closing remarks from staff? Victor, you did a great job. I have just a couple things to say about budgets. Okay, I'm sorry, Patrick, I don't want to cut you off. I, um, oh, no, no, go ahead, go, go yeah, right ahead. Just, just, you know, I think this is going to be re reiterating some of the comments you've heard for a while now. The Irrigate Lands Program has prioritized evaluating alternative regulatory frameworks for low risk commodity types. Um, this has led to the exemption of the Goose Lake sub watershed and managed wetlands in 2021, right from our program. Um, the resolution before you is very similar to the Goose Lake effort, except for the pesticide use, right? Um, in some of the upper Feather River um, operations, staff did thoroughly evaluate that pesticide use. We visited all of the operations that from our desktop evaluation raised questions about potential water quality um, threats. I really wanna thank um, the local producers and you see extension and researchers for getting us out on those farms. I know it was really difficult to, you know, gain the trust of, of um, the locals to have a number of regulators out in the field with them. But from those field visits, we did feel comfortable that um, they were not a water quality threat. We asked the UC researchers to um, document the conditions with the case studies, which um, Victor just talked about. I mean. Yeah, it's been a really collaborative effort. I want to thank all the folks involved. And with that, um, at least staff would like to recommend adoption of the resolution to exempt the Upper Feather River from the Irrigate Lands Program. And I, I would absolutely echo what, what Sue has to say and, and really kind of say that this, this measure and, you know, uh, for board member Yang and, and board member Abdus, uh, uh, who attended the small grower summit that Sue put together at the heart of a lot of these programs and at the heart of the work that um, was done to support this lies the University of California Cooperative Extension. Um, and I really want to echo Sue's specific thanks to the researchers and the on the ground folks who are involved on a day to day basis, talking with the growers, understanding their concerns, understanding you know, what they're doing to protect water quality and helping facilitate the communication between regulators and uh, the folks that are producing food for California. So I uh, really just want to echo that thanks and, and heartily endorse uh, uh, this uh, particular item for you today. Thanks, Patrick. Nick, did you have some follow-up comments? Yeah, I just, I, I appreciate that and uh, appreciate everybody um, that testified uh, today. Obviously, um, you know, we know that uh, one size fits all uh, when it comes to uh, uh, regulating threats to water, quali uh, water quality isn't um, necessarily the most uh, fair approach. Uh, and so with the Goose Lake sub watershed and now obviously uh, with what we have here today, um, I, I'd love to continue to see, you know, prioritizing this uh, adaptive prioritization evaluation 
uh, across these sub watersheds where it's appropriate. Um, certainly as uh, our thought process and uh, methods and metrics sort of evolve with time, you know, to see uh, certainly a shorter time frame. My folks have been waiting since 2016. Uh, you know, that's obviously uh, a considerable amount of uh, time, but understanding that, um, you know, I, you know, exempting folks from the ILRP is not something that's uh, taken lightly and has to be properly evaluated of whether there are opportunities to look at streamlining the process, certainly. And I appreciate, Patrick, uh, you bringing up the, the small growers uh, as well. You know, it's, uh, you know, where there are additional opportunities where the threats are, you know, low to no risk, especially when it comes to small growers where it's kind of a disproportionate burden. Um, I, I definitely uh, uh, want to continue to encourage that and, and welcome uh, that evaluation. So um, I'm pleased to see this day and obviously su support it. And uh, it may not be the right, the right solution for all situations, but where we can do this uh, properly um, and, and, um, and uh, efficiently, I definitely want to see that. So uh, thank you to everybody involved and I'm happy to, to make this motion pending further discussion from the board. Thank you, Nick. I guess uh, you know my my takeaway on this is that it's um, it's a process. Obviously, it's, it involves good science and a lot of cooperation with with the uh, with the ranchers up there and our staff and input from experts at UC Davis. Um, and this just makes common sense to me to adopt the order. So I'm also very much in support and really look forward to uh, continuing this process at other sub watersheds moving forward like the upper pit. So with that, um, I think we can close the hearing. And uh, Nick, you said you want to make a motion? Uh, yes. Second. Okay. Sean is seconded. So Mindy, please take the roll call. Board member Yang. Aye. Board member Aziz. Aye. Board member Brar? Yes. Board member Lee Reader? Aye. Vice Chair Kadara? Yes. And Chair Bradford? Yes. Thanks, Mindy. Okay, well, we're zipping right through this agenda. Uh, let's see what time, we got 10.20. Um, agenda item nine is the election of the chair and the vice chair for the coming year. And I think we have time, we should just go ahead and do this one. And then if, uh, I don't know, um, Jessica, are there gonna be any close session discussions this morning? Yes, there are. Okay, yeah, so maybe after this, we'll take a short break. So agenda item nine is the election of the chair and the vice chair. Um, any discussion or nominations? Yeah, typically we, we um, have nominations for the chair. Uh, and then we do the vice chair shortly thereafter. Uh, but everything is open for discussion at this point and self nominations are, are certainly allowed as well. Um, so uh, again, I think uh, Chair Bradford, um, feel free to open the floor and, and see what nominations wanna come in. Lee uh, Reader nominates board member Avdis for chair, I mean, vice chair. Thank this you. would be consideration of chair at this point. First, the chair. I, I pre appreciate that, um, but I would like to nominate uh, Mark. If you're interested in, in doing it again, I, I certainly am so supportive of that um, if, if you're up for it. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I, I am up for it for at least one more year. <laughs> and uh, Mark, I agree with Nick. I would, you know, if you're willing, would love to have you on for another year. Thank you, Raji. Okay, Mark, you're the man. So we're we're happy that you said yes already. So Everybody I support else. that as well. <laughs> Everybody else took a step back. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I'm happy to do it. I'm enjoying it. And I'm learning a lot every time we uh, have a discussion. So. And even though you are the chair, you can put the matter to a motion and formalize that. And we can move on to the vice chair. Okay. Uh, can we get a motion then? Um, I would. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Man. No, you do. <laughs> you, did it, you started it, so finish it up. Well, I'm trigger happy with the motion. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll move. 
I'll move the, uh, that Mark Bradford be uh, chair for the, this coming year. I'll second. Thank you, Elena. Um, Mindy, I'll take the roll call. Board member Yang. Seems like we're not taking a uh, rotation at all. Aye. Board member Abdus. Yes. Board member Brar. Yes. Board member Lee Reader. Aye. Vice Chair Kadara. Yes. And Chair Bradford. Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll move on then to the vice chair. I think we heard a, a motion already or a nomination already from Elena. I, can I just say I, I, I appreciate that? Sorry, Raji, but I, Denise, I'm I'm only would be interested if you're not interested in doing it again. So um, I would just say that. Okay. Well, well, well Nick, I, you took the words out of my mouth. Sorry, Denise, but I was going to say the same thing. So. And, and you guys will hear my spiel all the time. I'm here to serve the public. I don't need a title to serve. And the opportunity for Nick to, to serve in this capacity would be ideal as we get our board members groomed to, you know, move into leadership roles. That's what we want. That's what we expect to see. And I would certainly be honored to have him take that spot. Thanks. And would make the motion to do so if there's no one else. I would. We didn't blindside Denise today. We uh, we had a little chat <laughs> earlier. So. Denise, I, pre I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for your service on behalf of the public. And we know where to find you, Denise, if we need you. <laughs> well, I made a motion. She, we got a motion. We have a second. Second. Okay. Elena seconds. Okay. Uh, Mindy, can you take the roll call? Board member Yang. Aye. Board member Abdus. Yes. Board member Brar. Yes. Board member Lee Reader. Aye. Vice Chair Kadara. Yes. And Chair Bradford. Yes. Okay, thank you. I got that done nice and quick. I would add, you know, uh, Patrick pointed out um, that we we are kind of an anomaly in the uh, among the regional boards that most of the regional boards do tend to rotate the chair and the vice chair uh, on an annual or semi-annual basis at least. And uh, we've been different in that regard, largely because of Carl's presence on the board and his, his uh, incredible shadow that he cast as a as a board chair. So uh, moving forward, I think we will see more uh, changes in the leadership and we'd like to see that. It's good for everybody. So uh, that's just a little caveat for what transpired here today and what, what will probably transpire next year or two. So with that, if there aren't any more comments, I'll make one comment, uh, uh, Chair Bradford. First, I, I do want to thank everybody for um, for their service on the board. You know, as uh, mm. the public may not know, but this is uh, probably one of the most poorly uh, compensated positions, given the gravity of the decisions that that you make and that time that you invest in this. Um, you know, statewide. You know, paid a, paid a nominal. Uh, uh, stipend to, to show up to these board meetings, but the documents that you have to review and the types of decisions that you have to make are not easy. And in the future, I think it, uh, we'll be facing some pretty difficult concerns as we wrestle with the sustainability of groundwater and surface water in the Central Valley in the face of climate change and in the face of a lot of legal changes to uh, the regimes that we we work with, um, and that that is Sigma and waters of the U.S. and all manner of of kind of legal issues that that are involved in that. I would say kind of a couple things. Um, one, I will always entertain kind of requests from from you either at the board meeting or not at the board meeting uh, for uh, additional briefings on any topic that may be. Uh, coming up in front of the board or not even coming up in front of the board that you may have some interest in. Um, and that includes kind of the work groups that, that have been uh, doing a little bit of work. I, I imagine we're going to be leaning on the work groups a little bit more um, in the years to come, just because we've got some decisions that are going to be keyed up 
uh, for those discussions. And Denise, you know, if if you'd like to be a part of those work groups, I think um, uh, one suggestion could potentially be there is a vacancy on the uh, 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 basin assessment work group um, that uh, Raji currently sits on, that, that Carmen used to sit on with her. And there will be some discussion of tribal beneficial uses and, and other issues related to uh, uh, disadvantaged communities on, on that group as well. Um, so if you have any interest, just let us know and, and we'll kind of make that accommodation. And, and second, I do want to, you know, I know Denise, you are pulled a million different directions um, for all the work that you do in, in the South Valley. Um, but I would like to continue to work with you as we plan our board retreat uh, in June uh, that will help prepare us a little bit for uh, the tough decisions that we're gonna need to make in the latter half of 2023 and 2024 on issues pertaining to methylmercury, tribal beneficial uses, uh, dairy orders, and, and other things that may come in front of the board. So um, if, if you're willing, I'd like to continue to, to work with you and Chair Bradford on, on that particular uh, project that we, we've started. Well, I'll say it again, I'm, I'm here to serve and that, that's uh, my desire to, as, as long as I'm on the board and representing uh, the disadvantaged communities, as well as the constituents throughout our region, uh, any support I can give to help move us in the right direction, uh, I will be happy to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Anything else, Patrick, or all set? That's it for me. Again, much thanks to everybody who, who, who does this work. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's ten twenty-seven. Let's take a let's take a fifteen-minute break and be back. Let's let's just say ten forty-five. All right. Con congratulations, Nick. You're you're in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. I will say before we break here, though, Patrick, to your point, um, it is uh, a big commitment to serve on this board, but we cannot do it without competent uh, staff, and yes. and we have the E team in that. That's what gives me the confidence to continue to serve and willing to step up. Uh, is, it's really that. So thank you and to the rest of the staff. All right. That's good. Hey, Nick, I just need to let you know that Mark said he's going to be absent for the next six meetings. So you're going to have to serve as acting chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you waited till after the vote to point that yeah. out. Yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> Before we go to break. Um, I believe the only item we have left on the agenda is closed session, and we have a separate Zoom link for that. So hopefully all board members have that. Um, and I believe it was just sent around as well. Um, okay. To announce what we're going to be discussing, it is item D, the ESJ order, item G, the Winnemum Wintu tribe case, and item H, the premier resource management case. Okay, good. So that link was just resent? Yes. Okay, cool. Hey, right. Mark, I yeah. just want to echo, um, you say congratulate to you uh, to be our chair for this year. Uh, you had done a wonderful job last year, so congratulations. And congratulations to Nick for uh, being appointed to vice chair. So looking forward to working with you and the rest of the board. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Well, Jessica, this is Gene. Will we end this meeting if you're going to start the closed session? Or will you be coming back? Um, we won't have anything to um, discuss after closed session, so we can end the meeting here. Okay, I'll go. This is Bob, uh, Patrick, and everybody. I will go and uh, I will leave right now, and then I will go start up the closed session waiting for y'all. Okay, thanks, Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I just been adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.